I want to go ahead and open us in prayer. God, we do thank you for this day, and I thank you for these men and women who are gathered here tonight in your name. And Lord, we give this time to you and just pray that you will speak to us through this time, that you would use this time for your kingdom's glory. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you guys all for being here. And uh, I will tell you up front, this session is going to be, you're going to be fed with a fire hose, okay? And it may even be a little bit overwhelming. Subsequent sessions will not be as much. It's just there's a lot of material uh, for us to cover tonight. But I do thank each and every one of you for being here. Uh, this made my day. This refreshed my spirit that you were able to make it here tonight. And I hope that this uh, time of learning for you is a valuable one uh, with that. And so with that, tonight is, is going to be all about foundation building. As you, most of you know, a good foundation is important, right? To every building, to every project, a good foundation is important. When it comes to evangelism, uh, a good foundation is just as important. So that brings me to what birthed this project. Uh, what birthed this project is as a chaplain, uh, I, I had to handle a, several situations where individuals were in trouble at work for sharing their faith. We've probably all heard about them, right? How many of you have heard about them? You've heard about the situation where airmen get in trouble. Uh, they were they were uh, sharing their faith, or they were witnessing somebody on the job. Many of us have heard about that. We may not know someone uh, specifically, but when that happens, it hits the news, right? Well, I, I've known of a few very specific situations that, that that happened to, so that that creates a problem in that we need to find a way to make sure that these airmen are able to share their faith in such a way that honors God and also doesn't get them in trouble. And so in looking at those situations, initially, the initial thought was, what was their technique? They used a bad technique. A lot of times it's a situation where you have an airman who is kind of cornering people at work, you know, uh, kind of stalking them almost, uh, making them listen to him talk about his faith. So the first, the gut, the first initial thought was it had to do with technique, but uh, that, that thought wasn't satisfactory to me, so I prayed it over and felt like the Lord was leading me to do a study of the entire Bible on the topic of evangelism. Now, when the Lord led me to do that study, I thought it was going to take six months. It actually took 12, uh, because God said do it twice. So uh, I went verse by verse, chapter by chapter, every, every line in the Bible to determine what the Bible actually has to say about evangelism. And what I discovered is, uh, sure, technique was part of the issue, but uh, the issue with the technique was it goes back to theology. It goes back to what the Bible actually says evangelism is, and particularly how the Holy Spirit works through evangelism. Okay, And so it goes back to foundations. Function follows form. And what was happening uh, was these airmen had a, a form, well-meaning, Love of the Lord, but had a form that maybe didn't help them uh, to be effective, but also had them getting in trouble. And a lot of it had to do with the foundation, the foundation of what evangelism is. And so I want to present to you, first of all, two images of evangelism. These are two images that maybe you've seen in the Air Force, okay? Uh, this one, I call this one the Work Center Preacher. Uh, I made these names up, by the way. Actually, that's my professor, Staff Sergeant Dolan. Staff Sergeant Dolan is nicknamed Preacher Boy by all those in his flight. His quickness to criticize the lifestyles of his co-workers is legendary. He's even been known to corner some of the younger airmen in the squadron to tell them about his faith. When questioned about the appropriateness of his actions, Staff Sergeant Dolan responds, It's better to obey God than the AFIs. Besides, some of his airmen could have walked away at any time. Some of you have probably known that airman. Maybe some of you have been that airman. This is oftentimes the type of airman that we see that does get in trouble. Uh, somebody ultimately, they, they file an EO complaint. Uh, worse yet, they, they end up getting uh, stiffer paperwork as a result of it. So that's one image. And that's the image that most people, when asked about evangelism, that's the image they think of in the military. And so when the word evangelism is even mentioned in the military, people, they cringe. They, they get scared because nobody gets in trouble. So here's another image that maybe isn't, is one that you, you didn't think of as uh, being an evangelist. Senior Airman Campbell is well liked by everyone in his flight. Though it is 
been well established that he's a Christian senior airman Campbell has the uncanny ability to make friends with those with whom he disagrees. Senior airman Campbell's life, though not perfect, seems to be working. As a result, others in his squadron, to include a few of the NCOs, have sought his advice on life issues. Okay? How many of you would have thought of this as being an image of evangelism? Some of you might have, some of you may not have, but this also is evangelism. And, and this is, uh, is there anything in this one that would get an airman in trouble? Not, not a thing. Living out his faith, or her faith, uh, doing the right things, nothing would get this airman in trouble. So these are a couple images of, of evangelism that I want to present to you. So before we go further, I want to present a couple definitions to you. And this is a definition that, again, I speak here, <coughs> I went, read through the Bible twice on the issue of evangelism. And this is a definition that we're going to be working with for the next six weeks. Uh, notice a couple things. Display of a lifestyle. Lifestyle is important to evangelism. Uh, declaration of the gospel as opportunity arises. And we'll get further into that in session four. Uh, the direction towards repentance for those the Holy Spirit leads to respond. We'll talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit uh, here in session three. And then discipling. A lot of times people don't think of discipleship as being part of evangelism. But when you look in the scripture, there was always a demand that people who come to Christ grow. Uh, this, this notion that happens a lot of times where people come to Christ and we leave them on the sidelines, we pray that eventually they'll make a, a lordship decision, isn't a model that we find in scripture. If we look in scripture, people come to Christ and they start growing. So this is the definition we'll be working from. But then what is the gospel? Uh, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, well, uh, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Uh, he was buried and he was raised on the third day. I didn't know what Chaplain Sutton was preaching on yesterday, and he didn't know what I was teaching on, but it's something that worked right into this. He's right. It is the engine that drives our faith. And so the gospel, four traits about the gospel, uh, it's presented as the Holy Spirit. And you, you notice that I, I've said that twice now, right? I guess the laser doesn't work on the TV. The Holy Spirit. It's important to understand that the Holy Spirit is involved in evangelism. A lot of times when airmen get in trouble, it's because they're getting ahead of the Holy Spirit. And they're doing it through their own energy. And it's, it's man-centered. Uh, becomes effectual, those who repent and confess. Scripture tells us people have to repent, they have to confess. That's what Scripture says. Uh, those who do receive grace and those who repent are expected. Again, a lot of times we, a lot of evangelism, a lot of evangelism conferences, a lot of times in churches, it's almost a, an option. Somebody, hey, wow, they're actually getting involved in church. No, really it should be the expectation that they're going to get involved and grow. So, with that, uh, three tra four tra rather three traits of biblical evangelism. This is going to get unpeeled throughout the seminar. Again, this is your fire hose session. Okay, where, where I'm basically summarizing, and then in the next five, I'll unpack it. Okay, it's communal. Uh, the lone wolf Christian is not a paradigm we find in the Bible. It's attractional. Uh, those who, who are proclaiming should have things about them that other people want to know about, whether it be their life is working well, or they, they should be not off-putting. They should be the other way. And then it's also relational. It makes a connection between one's life and the gospel. These are traits, if you look at the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, every single time we see an example of evangelism, these traits are present. And so, biblical evangelism is communal, it's attractional, it's relational. Okay. I know I'm going fast. Notes are available later. Okay. So with that, we're going to go through the Bible now. Again, you're thinking... Chaplain, the whole Bible, don't worry. But still, I'm going to feed you with a fire hose. We see a difference in the way evangelism is conducted in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, how many of you are sitting here thinking, well, I never really considered evangelism in the Old Testament? Anybody, is this kind of a new thing idea to any of you? Most of the time, people don't go to the Old Testament looking to see evangelism happen. But it does happen. And it was primarily centripetal. Uh, it, was, it was a come and see model. It wasn't it. Uh, essentially what would happen is God's people would live out their lives and people would come and see what they had going for them. So, believe it or not, 
Evangelism is seen in creation. Okay? And that is that God wanted humanity to display his character. Why is it important for humanity to display God's character? Anybody want to maybe give an idea there? We were made in his image. We were made in his image, exactly. And, and that is a key thing to remember. We were made in his image. Uh, why, why does God want us to display his character, though? I do. I have some pre. Get those together. Anybody know why it would be important? Why, why does God want us to display His image? So others can follow. So others can follow. Does life go better when people know His God's image? Yeah. I'd say life is always better when people know God. But then also, and this is this is always the answer. God created creation for His glory. And so, uh, God wants us to display His character. We see that embedded within creation from the very beginning. And you hit on it. You were ahead of me there. <laughs> God said, let us make man in our image. Of course, speaking there, we see a, a Trinitarian formula there. Uh, and get, so God made man in His own image. Male and female, He created them in His image. And then He told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Does that not look like evangelism to you? Fill the earth and subdue it. Make the glory of God known throughout the earth. Present His image to every square inch of creation. Okay? From the very beginning, God wants His name known. And that my brothers and sisters, is evangelism. So it's, it's embedded within the very fiber of creation. It wasn't an idea that Jesus had after he was resurrected. It's, it, it's built into the fiber of creation. Now as we skip forward to the patriarchs, and, and that is individuals uh, prior to Moses, and if you ever do the math on that, how many of you read the book of Genesis rather recently? Yeah. Recently enough to remember kind of how it flows? Anybody remember how many chapters are in the book of Genesis? 50. Okay. But if you ever do the math in the book of Genesis, there's a lot of the time that earth has been around in the book of Genesis. I mean, I'm doing public math here, but roughly half of the time that there's been is the book of Genesis. A lot happened there. But when we look at the patriarchs, their faith and obedience was their witness. Okay. They were faithful to God. They were obedient to God. As, and, and as they were faithful to God and they lived differently than the people around them, it was a witness. Uh, consider Isaac. Uh, Isaac uh, ended up uh, going and living uh, with the Philistines for a while. And the scriptures say the Lord blessed him. And, he, and he, he became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Now, I will qualify this to say an Old Testament evidence of God's blessing would have been material blessing. Okay. Now if you're sitting here thinking that's awesome, the New Testament trait of God's blessing is not material blessing. It's actually uh, persecution. It's actually trials. Okay. So if you're sitting here thinking, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. God's blessing. Actually, scripturally, it's trials and tribulations are the trait of New Testament faithful people. Uh, so Salvation costs you nothing, but Jesus didn't say it'd be easy. In fact, he promised you otherwise. But nonetheless, okay, so Isaac has this evidence right here. So much so, it says the Philistines envied him. And uh, it says, go away from you, for you are much mightier than we. Now, is this a witness to the Philistines of the presence of God? I would suggest to you it is. Now, did they respond in such a way that would show faith? They didn't. But, see, it's the witness's job to do the witnessing. It's God's job to give the increase. So, I would suggest to you that Isaac was evangelistic towards the Philistines in that he obeyed God and God blessed him as a result. It's up to God to give the increase. And another example... Uh, Joseph, and I love, I love the book of Joseph, I, I, I mean the story of Joseph, I read it regularly, I even love watching Joseph's amazing technicolor dream coat, though there's some inaccuracies in it, but nonetheless, uh, when Joseph ends up interpreting the dreams, remember he was sold into slavery, then he, 
you know, he, he was put in prison, and then he, he interpreted some dreams for a couple guys. One of them died, one of them lived. The guy who lived forgot for a long time. Pharaoh has some dreams, needs somebody to interpret it. The guy who forgot said, oh, wait a minute, forgot about Joseph. They bring Joseph out. He, he cleans up. He does what? He interprets the dreams. And then tells Pharaoh, you need to do this to save your people. And then Pharaoh's response is, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? How many of you would love to hear that said about you? Can we find somebody like this? The Spirit of God is in this guy. I mean, that, it doesn't get any better than that. Pharaoh, a pagan king, knew the Spirit of God was in Joseph. And it's because Joseph lived his life in obedience to the Lord. But then as we skip forward to the law, uh, the whole purpose of Israel was to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was their whole purpose. Their whole reason for being was to be a witness to the people around them. Again, a, a, a centrifugal, uh, a, a rather centripetal uh, type of witness would be what we would mostly see. And then we skip ahead to the historical books. How many of you struggle in the historical books? Okay, if you do, be you're, you're not alone. I'm just going to tell you that. You're not alone. Uh, if you're ever having trouble reading them, I, I say mix in some psalms, some gospel. You know, kind of read a little bit every day. I've got a reading plan. If you need a reading plan, I can help you with that. Uh, you'll, read, you'll, you'll read through the Bible in about three years, but you'll never get bored. So, nonetheless, uh, the historical books, sometimes they were witnesses through their faithfulness, but sometimes, guess what? They were witnesses to their, through their unfaithfulness. Can you believe that? Sometimes, when we're unfaithful to God, it's still a witness to Him. Now, as Paul said, shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? What was Paul's response? Do you remember? Well, God forbid. Exactly. Good King James there. God forbid. May it never be in some newer translations. But nonetheless... Even when God's people are unfaithful, it still has the God can still turn that around. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, anybody remember that story on David? Anybody remember that story, David and Goliath? And uh, why did why did David go out to kill Goliath? Notice something in this verse. His reason being, he, he tells you, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds there, and the wild beasts thirst. Notice this last part. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. We don't typically think of slaying our enemies as evangelism. But nonetheless, <laughs> David's purpose for doing that was so that it would be established that there was a God in Israel. His concern was the glory of God. It wasn't about going rah, 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 I got the bad guy. If you read that, if you read that text, and this is just one verse from that story, his concern is that this Philistine, this Goliath guy, is blaspheming God. And his concern is not you know, taxation, his concern is not uh, right to carry, or, or whatever his concern was. His concern was this guy standing up there speaking garbage about my God, and i got to stop it. Okay? It was the glory of God. That was his concern. And through his obedience, it testified to the Philistines, what? That the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. But then as a negative example, Manasseh, by the way, he was actually the king that was the king of, uh, of Judah the longest. And yet, he was the king that caused God to say, you know, I'm going to destroy I'm going to destroy Judah. He already destroyed Israel at this point. I'm going to destroy Judah. And, uh, and notice here he says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Ju Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. How about that? You see, God was saying, My people are not obedient, and my name is getting blasphemed by my people. And so therefore, I'm going to punish them so that the nations will know who I am. The nations will know that I'm holy. A holy God does what? He judges, right? And if he were not judging, his name would be blasphemed. And so we see in the historical documents, he, 
even through disobedience, God's name is still glorified. And then uh, it goes on, I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into a land of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and spoil all their enemies, because they have done what is evil in my sight and provoked me to anger since the day of their father. So God, he's not going to tolerate disobedience. And he may take the disobedience of his people and use that as an opportunity to bring glory to his name. So evangelism still happened. God wants his name to come. That's the theme. God wants his name known. And then we look at the prophets. Their whole message was a reminder. Their whole message was a reminder that Israel existed to proclaim the name of the Lord. Malachi. Anybody like the book of Malachi? The book of Malachi is neat. And I love this verse. From the rising of the sun to the setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, said the Lord of hosts. Do you think God wants his name known? I think he does. I think that's pretty evident there. God wants the nations to know who he is. Life goes better when people know who God is. God is loving as people know who he is. And so Malachi came along to remind the, the children of Israel who were exiled and who were now trickling back into, in, into the Holy Land that God wanted his name known. But then the prophets also uh, foretold of the day of Israel's redemption. <coughs> Book of Ezekiel, which by the way, let me give you a, a summary of God at work in Ezekiel. God is trying to salvage his own name out of the gutter. Okay? Because the children of the, the Israelites had so soiled the name of the Lord that God is acting on his own behalf to say, I'm going to renew the holiness that is befitting my name. And we see here in verse 23 where it says, or Rather, it says, uh, Thus said, it's not for your sake, of, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. Okay? What does that mean? It's not for your sake. Does that mean that, you know, how many times do we think that God does things for our, our sake, if we're honest? So it's easy to fall into that. You know, God really loves me, He's going to do things for me. Well, God does really love you, but it's for His sake that He does it. And, uh, and then it says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great what? My na great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I will indicate my holiness before your eyes. God wants to be known by his creation. God's creation is evangelistic by nature. And so, when the children of Israel were failing to do it, God sent his prophets to, pro to foretell a time when that would happen. And then we have the Psalms. And the Psalms uh, speak a lot of that, but a couple of them I want to highlight on. Psalm 67, which we actually read a couple weeks ago for the, uh, the, the uh, call to worship. Do you guys remember that one? Psalm 67 uh, finishes, it's only seven verses, but it finishes by saying, uh, all the ends of the earth, all the, all the nations of the earth will fear him. God has blessed us as a result. It's this idea that God has blessed us for the sake of knowing, or, or for the sake of allowing the nations to know who we are. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about all the ways God's blessed you. Is it possible that God has blessed you for those ways because God wants the people of the world to know who he is through you? I would suggest to you, based on Psalm 67, that's exactly why God um, blesses us. And so Psalm 67 says that. Okay, then Psalm 96 reminds the God's people of the missional nature of monotheism. Okay, that's a lot of words, isn't it? Missional nature of monotheism. Let me unpack that for you. Okay? As we look at, as, as we look at the Old Testament... God reveals himself to Abraham, right? And as we go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, we get the sense with Jacob that Jacob believed that the Lord was the God he worshipped, but perhaps that he did not, he was not fully convinced that God was the only God. Okay? Case in point, uh, when when 
Jacob takes his two wives, actually his two wives and his two concubines, and leaves his father-in-law and is on the run. Uh, his wife Rachel steals the household idols. That's what Scripture says. Okay. We find that when Jacob gets to Canaan, he buries the household idols. He doesn't destroy them, he buries them. By burying them, he is reflecting that he truly believed that these were real gods. Okay? So, the Israelites were not true monotheists. They believed that there were other gods, but that their god was the god they needed to worship. And really, until Isaiah... When we see in Isaiah, the Lord says, I am the Lord, there is no other. Okay? It isn't really till uh, the book of Isaiah, which is about 400 <coughs> years after Moses, when we see this idea finally brought forth, that God says, not only am I not one of many gods, and not only am I not the strongest God, I am the only God there is, okay? So we see that idea in Psalm 96, this idea that God is the only one. Now, why is it important that the world knows that there's only one God? Because there is only one God. Because there is one. That, that's, that's a great, that, that's one. If there's only one God, what does that mean to the world? There's only one way to get to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven. Right? That if God, if God is that way, if there is only one way to get to heaven, if there's only one God, he needs to be obeyed. Okay? And so therefore, if we know there's only one God, then we have an obligation to make sure that those people know. Okay? Monotheism by its very nature is missional because we cannot be satisfied that, okay, those people, they've got their God and that's fine, but we've got their God. Our God. No, they don't have any God. If they don't have our God, we only have one God. There's only one God. It's the Lord God. And so monotheism is, is by definition, missional. Now I want to present to you a couple uh, examples of evangelism from the Old Testament. Believe it or not, we have moved through the Old Testament. How many of you are breathless? I know I'm breathless. Okay. All right. A couple examples. Jethro. No, not the band. Okay. See younger ones like, what? Okay. So we find Jethro. Does anybody remember anybody remember who Jethro was? <coughs> he was Moses' father-in-law. Okay? And he was actually the priest of Midian, which meant that he was really a he, he was a pagan priest. He was one of those guys who, you know, cut open chickens and whatever. He was a pagan priest, okay? Well, Jethro comes to pay Moses and his daughter, uh, Zipporah, a visit. And he, he looks, and this is after the, uh, after the Israelites had come out of, out of Egypt. Remember the sea parted, they came through. The Egyptians tried to chase them. The Egyptians got flooded out. Okay, so this is, at this point, they're now wandering in the wilderness. They're eating bread that falls from heaven. Pretty cool, right? Be better than the defect, right? So eating bread that falls from heaven, uh, they've got a, a, a cloud that guides them in the daytime, they've got a pillar of fire that guides them at the night. in the night. Life is good for these people. And so Jethro notices this and he makes this statement. He says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. He's not really truly a monotheist yet, but bear with him. He's greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. Okay? So, Jethro looks. Remember I told you uh, evangelism is communal, it's relational, and it's attractional. Okay? So, as Jethro sees the way that the Israelites are living, he sees a community. It's communal. Okay? And then he sees that life is good, which is attractional. It attracts him to the way they live. And then it is relational in the sense that he makes the connection. Life is good for the Israelites because they obey God. Okay? So we see all three traits of evangelism in the story of Jethro. We also see the example of the Queen of Sheba. She was a queen. Sheba, by the way, Probably about where the modern day country of Yemen is now. So, if you look at a map, that's a lot of territory to cross. 
Okay? You got to cross the whole Arabian desert to get to Israel. Okay? And so, um, my, my slide quit, clicked too fast there. You don't see that yet. No. <laughs> but the Queen of Sheba, the, the Bible says that she had heard word that Solomon was a really good king. Okay? And so she traveled to Israel because she wanted to test Solomon with hard questions. Okay? Uh, there's a, a parenthetical lesson in that, and that is. Sometimes when people really bring hard questions to you that give you headaches, it might be a good thing. Okay, Be patient with them. And be patient with yourself. But the scriptures say that, that the Queen of Sheba tested Solomon with hard questions and observed his, his court and observed his servants and observed his stuff. And as a result, she, she uh, looked at it and she recognized that God had blessed him uh, mightily as a result, and, and she attributed, again, it was, it was communal. She looked at the community of Israel and recognized how much they had been blessed. It was attractional. She heard all this word, she came, and then she actually said, it was, it was even better than I thought it was. It was better uh, than they told me it was. And then uh, it, was, it was, and this is in First Kings 10, by the way. And then it was relational in that she made the connection that Solomon was a great king, not because he was like a super smart guy, but because the Lord was with him. Okay? So these are a couple key, and there are many other examples. We could go into Rahab out the prostitute. We could go into Ruth. We could go into uh, the Midianites. There are many other examples in Scripture of those who heard and saw what God was doing for their people. And as a result, they came to see what God was doing, and they made the connection. Again, Old Testament evangelism was centripetal. It was a come and see effect. But then we move forward to the New Testament. Now we'll tell you this. Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it. Okay? All the evangelism methods that worked in the Old Testament still work. But Jesus came to add to them. Okay? So the gospel is still centripetal as well. But when we look at the New Testament, it's primarily centrifugal. It is a go-and-tell model. Okay? There's a primary shift. There's only one, by the way, there's only one example in Scripture in, in the Old Testament where anybody went to tell anything about the Lord. Did anybody just stop the top of their head and maybe take a guess? Jonah. Very good. Jonah is the sole example. However... What we see in the story of Jonah, A, is there was no real gospel. It was 40 days of destruction. Uh, but then the book of Jonah was really more about Jonah. It was really more, and it was really more about the children of Israel's lack of seeing their role as being those who had compassion on the nations because they didn't know God, and they were not living in such a way as to show the glory of God. So really, it was a rebuke to Jonah and the Israelites for not practicing evangelism more than it is an example of evangelism. But I brought that up because a lot of times people think about that. What about Jonah? Not really a good example. He's kind of a dirtbag, you know. He really is. I've got a good sermon series on Jonah. Maybe I'll preach it down here. I'm fine with it. But anyway, right. we shift to the New Testament. Are you breathless yet? Okay. All right. So we shift to the New Testament and we find a paradigm shift in that the primary methods of evangelism are a go and tell method. So we see Jesus. I mean, you would agree Jesus is the best example we can come up with. And it is the Sunday school answer. It is. A lot of times people always want to answer Jesus. The answer is to salvation is always Jesus, but I may ask you questions during the course of the seminar that that's not the answer. But nonetheless... Jesus saw evangelism as his mission. When he went to the, the temple and they asked him to read, uh, at the, I mean, rather at the synagogue, and they asked him to read, he read this verse, and this is from Isaiah. Remember I told you the prophets told of the time of the redemption? The book of Isaiah is incredibly messianic. Uh, the first, like, adult Bible I ever had, had a star next to every messianic prophecy in the Bible. And if you go through the book of Isaiah, it's, it's, there are places, chapters 40 through 
56 primarily, but also if you go back to Isaiah, <coughs> where there's a star next to pretty much every verse, Messianic prophecies. And, and, and Jesus, he chose to read these verses. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to do what? Proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus saw evangelism as his mission. This was why he was here. He was here to proclaim the good news. But then also, he taught his followers about evangelism. Um, Jesus wasn't the only one doing evangelism during, in the Gospels. He taught his followers about it. Uh, three parables, by the way, that really hit on evangelism. Salt and light. Uh, that's... Um, where it talks about if the salt loses its saltiness, it's not good for anything except being trampled underfoot. And then it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid, neither do you. Hide a light under a bushel. Let your light shine before men so they may see your uh, works and glorify your God in heaven. The point here, lifestyle matters. If you claim to know Jesus and you live in such a way that is contrary to the word of God, you're hiding your light under a bushel. You've lost your saltiness. And that is what that parable reminds us. And then there's the parable of the sower. The man goes out and sows seed. He throws some on, on rocky soil. He throws some on uh, shallow soil. He sh throws some on thorny soil. Then he throws some on good soil. If you remember in the parable, the birds eat up the rocky soil. And the stuff in the shallow soil springs up quick, but then it, it withers. And then uh, the stuff in the thorny soil, it grows, but the thorns choke it out. But the stuff in the good soil uh, produces a, 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 you know, it grows uh, a hundredfold. It, it produces a crop. And, and the idea there is that the soil makes a difference. And so when we talk about evangelism, this is where a lot of people get in trouble, okay? They think it's them, all right? A lot of times people think, well, I'm, I'm sharing Christ with so-and-so, and they're not accepting Christ. I must be doing it wrong. Okay? Don't tell yourself that. Okay? The soil makes a difference. Where God may not be at work in that person. Or that person may be resisting the Spirit. And there's some other theology on that we're not going to go into. But uh, it's a mystery a little bit why some accept Christ and some don't. There is some mystery there. But the point being is the sower did his job. What was the sower's job? Sow the seed. That's all. That's his job. I'm sowing seed. God's going to do with this seed what he's going to do. I'm just to sow it. Okay? Same is true for us. We have to sow the seed, but the soil makes a difference. And then there's the, the parable of the wedding feast. Okay? In the parable of the wedding feast, man has a wedding feast. He asks all these people to come. Uh, they don't come. So he goes out to the hedges and highways, begs some other people to come, some of them come, then there's a guy there that doesn't have on the right clothes. Uh, the man asks him, why aren't you in wedding clothes? He's speechless, throws him out. Okay? <coughs> What's the takeaway there? The takeaway there is there's divine grace. God reveals himself to people, but still people are responsible for that. And again, there are volumes and volumes written on how much responsible? How does that work? How does the Holy Spirit draw someone? Can someone resist the Spirit? Volumes and volumes and volumes written on it. We may not agree on that, and we may not come to agreement because we've got like 2,000 years of church history where people have been arguing over that. But the point everyone would agree on is that there's grace and there's responsibility. Both are present, and that's what we see in that parable. And these were, uh, these were ways that Jesus taught his followers about evangelism. Okay? But then, he also taught his followers to evangelize. Uh, there's a lot of people who, who think that evangelism is only for select few, but yet we find that Jesus teaches his followers to evangelize. He taught the twelve to evangelize, and when he taught the twelve to evangelize, he told them only to go to the lost sheep of Israel. But then he taught the seventy-two to evangelize, and he, he didn't put that prohibition on them. And, and we will actually get into that in session five, okay? We'll get into that in session five, a little bit about why he would do that with the 12, but not with the 72. It'll make sense as we get in there. But nonetheless, he taught his followers to evangelize. But then also, he motivated his followers through the Great Commission.
Okay. Matthew 28 says what? All authority has been given to me under heaven and earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the ages. Okay. And then John 21. That's the great interaction between Jesus and Peter, where he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Uh, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Peter's hurt that Jesus keeps asking him this. And there's some Greek there. It's different versions of love. But the takeaway there is that Jesus says, feed my little lambs. Okay? The idea there is if we love Jesus, we're going to do what? We're going to feed the sheep. Right. So he motivated his followers through the Great Commission. And there's really three motivations. First of all, the motivation to make more of yourselves. Okay? So, Jesus taught his disciples to evangelize, right? And then he told his disciples to do what? Make disciples. So, it would stand to reason that the disciples they would make would also evangelize. And there, there, is a, there are those who will teach you that evangelism was only for the apostles. They were the only people who were supposed to evangelize. That command isn't given to anyone else. We'll go into Paul, into the, the epistles in a little bit. We'll go to the book of Acts. You'll see that they didn't believe that. But the point being there is the disciples, when they were told to make disciples, they understood it to mean make some more of yourselves. And Jesus taught them to disciple. But then there's also the motivation of the victory and presence of God. Okay, anybody have a sports team that's won recently? Gosh, none of you? I mean, like, won anything big? Like, I'm a Denver Broncos fan, okay? Uh, yeah, I was rooting for them when they stuck, so I'm not a fair weather fan. But what happens when a team, like, wins a world championship? What happens in the city? Everybody goes crazy. Everybody goes crazy. In most cities, they have ticker tape parties, <coughs> parties. In LA, they burn the city down. But everybody goes crazy uh, when their sports team wins, okay? There's a motivation that comes from being victorious, right? There's an energy. There's an excitement that comes from being victorious. And so the Great Commission shows us, you know, Jesus says, all authority, right? Heaven and earth has been given to me. There's a motivation that comes and then, then, he, then he sandwiches that with, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So not only do we have the guy that has all authority, where is he at? He, he's in heaven, but then he says he's with us, right? So he sends his spirit to be with us. So we have, we have God with us, and he's got all authority. So that's a motivation, and he won. So and then motivation of love for Christ. We already talked a little bit about that. If you love me, do what? Do my sheep. Okay, so, then we look at the book of Acts. If you look at the book of Acts, those people took evangelism seriously. I challenge you to read in the book of Acts. Every time, everywhere they go, uh, they're, they're taking the evangelism seriously. Uh, again, Chaplain Sutphin preached uh, yesterday on Acts chapter 1. He pointed out that they, they were to stay in Jerusalem and receive power when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, then they would be, their, uh, be his witnesses. And he, and he kind of gave a, a concentric circle, a, a Jerusalem, and then Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Okay? In Acts chapter 8, Stephen is stoned. At the, he, at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is actually stoned. Okay? And for those of you that are younger, that means getting killed with rocks, not, not Colorado 420. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, when Stephen gets stoned, stoned the, the Christians scatter. Okay? They scatter uh, because persecution has come. Our new NCYC. You were showing me our new NCYC. Wolfpack Wheels is here. So, um, but here, the Christians scatter, but what do they do where they scatter? They start telling people about Jesus. They start starting churches. Now imagine part of it had to be the attractional element. Hey, why are you moving here? People don't just move around, right? Have you ever met anybody that just moved someplace? Did you ask them why they moved there? Any of you ever done that? I mean, we're military. We move all the time. Yeah, they're moving here. because saying, why'd you move to Goonson? Uh, duh, military. But, uh, but you know, if, if we had someone like... 
Well, imagine whatever town you were from, and you had someone from Zimbabwe move to that town. You know, let's say you live in the middle of Iowa. Somebody from Zimbabwe moves there, okay? You're probably going to go, hey, you know, well, well, why'd you move to Iowa? I mean, you're, the question's going to come up, right? So you've already got an attractional situation, and you've got a, a communal situation in that the more Christians form, the more of a critical mass they have, and then that is relational. We move because of the gospel. Let me tell you about the gospel, and people look at their lives and like, wow, if they would just leave instead of saying, okay, I don't believe that stuff, maybe there's something to it, okay? So despite persecution, in fact, the spread of the gospel historically seems to be fueled by persecution. Chew on that one. Okay? And then we find that their paradigm was largely first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. In session five, we'll talk about why that works. And why, again, we're talking about the context of you guys being airmen, big A, whatever your rank is, being evangelists. Why it's important that we have those who practice evangelism who are A1Cs and and those who practice evangelism who are tech sergeants, and those who are lieutenants, and those who are chiefs, and those who are colonels, and those who are female, and those who are male, and those who are maintainers, and those who are operators, and those who are medics, and those who are civil engineers, or whatever your job is. Why it's important that we have so many different types of evangelists. We'll get into that a little bit in chapter 5, but it has to do, but the phenomenon that, that why that matters is the same phenomenon why they went to the Jews first, and I'll get to that a little bit later. And then there's the epistles. Uh, the epistles, that would be all of Paul's writing, but then the book of Hebrews, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Okay? The epistles taught about evangelism. Ephesians 6, full armor of God. You guys like that passage? If you, if, yeah, I encourage you to pray that passage. We'll get into that a little bit next week, by the way. Um, but in there, we notice one piece of armor is shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Uh, I grew up in rural Louisiana. You know what that meant? We didn't wear shoes around the house. Walk in the house, you didn't wear shoes. Okay. In the summer, I might go all summer without putting on shoes. Except to go to church. But you know, when you saw mom put on the shoes, you know what that meant? Church. It meant church. But if it weren't the church day, it meant we were going somewhere. Because that's the only time the cho shoes ever happen. That meant we were going somewhere. We were going to do something. Okay? I'm still that way. You'll see me. If you ever stop by my door, I'm barefoot. Uh, in the office, I'm barefoot sometimes, too. But at any rate. Just saying. But at any rate. The whole purpose of the readiness is so that we can tell about the Lord. So that's the whole purpose of the armor of God. The Bible, the, the, the epistles also taught passive evangelism. Now, when I speak of passive evangelism, I'm speaking really synonymously with lifestyle evangelism, active evangelism, actively telling people about Jesus. Passive evangelism is about that which witnesses to what we do with no words. And, and notice what Paul uh, told the Christians. He says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way. It's important to, for us to analyze our lives and ask if we're putting a, an obstacle in the way at times. Uh, you know, Paul did point out in, in 1 Corinthians, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And, and I will challenge you as we go through the seminar to consider that. Maybe there are things that you do that, you know, they're, they're not, they're, the Bible doesn't say they're wrong, but maybe they're not a good witness. Or maybe there are things that you do that, you know, the Bible says don't do that. And, and, and you're thinking, well, gee, I like doing this, but it's not really spreading the gospel if I do this. Okay? How we live our lives, very important. It's got to be attractional. The Bible also teaches evangelism is a spiritual gift. Now some of you are thinking, ah, oh, that's it. I don't have the gift of, spirit, of evangelism. I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't either. Okay? However, the Bible does not make that a requirement for practicing evangelism. 
There are people who for some reason seem to be supernaturally, you can witness to them for months, years. And then that person will walk in five minutes later, they're accepting Christ. You're like, what? How did that happen? You still have a part in that. That's still your fruit. You were still faithful. So, we do see that spiritual gift, but you're not off the hook either way. Uh, the scriptures tell us that we're always to be sober-minded, and endure suffering, do the work of evangelists. That's what Paul told Timothy. If Paul told Timothy, I've known a few, have you may ever known anybody that you felt like had the gift of evangelism? You know, you do not have to tell those people to do evangelism. They just do it, okay? It's like telling you to breathe. You just do it, okay? This tells me that Timothy did not have to get to evangelists, but Paul told him to do what? To do the work of an evangelist. Remember, as Paul said, he says, I, I, you know, he, he's talking to the, uh, the Corinthians and says, I planted Apollos water, but God made it grow. God gives the increase. So even if you're, you don't have the gift of evangelism, even if you don't actually get to actively lead somebody to Christ, you still have a role and it's still essential. Okay? So we're still called to evangelize. Okay. And then the, uh, the epistles also talk boldness in regards to evangelism. In Hebrews 3, 6, we're told that Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Uh, anybody's mama ever tell them it's not good to boast? <laughs> There's certain things it's not good to boast about. You can boast all day about the Lord. You know, Paul said, he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Uh, the fact is, we are to be bold. We are to, to let people know as occasions happen, as the Holy Spirit leads, as they ask, and as, as opportunity arises. This is the hope I have. And, and, and again, that doesn't mean cornering them in the hangar with the gospel track. It's not really a biblical mode of evangelism because it's getting ahead of the Holy Spirit. But, if you live your life right, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, if you're doing the things... Uh, that we're going to cover in this seminar, a little bit about preparing the soil, and people ask, you can be confident. Well, hey, you know, how, how is it that you, you, know, you seem so joyful? You know, I don't know, it's good coffee. No, that's not right. You know, this is an opportunity. If people do that, you're like, oh, blue opportunity. But we are to be bold. And then the epistles taught evangelism as an expression of hope. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts honor Christ as Lord. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You've got to preach the gospel to yourselves every day as well. You've got to remind yourselves every day that you are redeemed. You've got to remind yourselves that you were lost that Jesus stepped into your life, you know Him now, and you have hope. This is what will keep you going. Uh, I can tell you this, 14 and a half years as a chaplain, I never saw anybody suicide who had hope. Okay, People have hope they're going to live. And the ultimate hope is what? It's redemption through Christ. It's Jesus, exactly. That is the ultimate hope. And so, if you're ever, parenthetically, if you're having a hard time getting through your day sometimes, wondering why you're doing this, Preach the gospel to yourself. Okay? Remind yourself you have hope. So, <sighs> then go into the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation says this we win. Okay? And that's ultimately. The book of Revelation, by the way, was meant to be an encouragement to God's people. And uh, there are many different interpretations of it. I got my own. But ultimately, that's the message of the book of Revelation. We win. God wins. His name gets known throughout the earth. And that's what God wanted. He wanted it from creation. He wanted it through the patriarchs on into the establishing Israel. Even in the historical times when they were disobedient, He still wanted it known. He sent the prophets to remind God's people that they needed that to happen and that redemption was coming. He, the Psalms proclaim the glory of God. Jesus came he displayed the glory of God. He taught the glory of God. He taught His people how to share 
the glory of God, and then He sent us out to do it. He sent us His Spirit to do it. And then uh, we have the epistles where we see, or we have Acts where we see examples of people doing it. And we have the epistles that tell us to do this because you have hope. Do it in words. Do it in lifestyle. God wants His name known. Remember I told you, this might be a little overwhelming. It should be. It should be overwhelming because we have an awesome job here to do. And that is to make the name of the Lord known throughout the earth. Evangelism has always been the heartbeat of God. It wasn't a plan that came along after the resurrection. It's always been there. So, with that, okay, if you're wondering, well, how long are you going to go? You just covered 66 books of the Bible. Okay, this is what we're going to cover in the... Just an overview, spiritual fitness training. We're going to talk a little bit about how you individually can prepare yourself spiritually for sharing the gospel. Session three, we're going to talk a little bit more on the corporate level. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit moves through His people. Remember, one of the traits of evangelism is it's communal. Okay, so we're going to we're going to take it from an individual level. We're going to go to a communal level. Then session four, evangelism with style. We're going to focus on some ways you can share your faith because people like to have ways to do it. Then relationships matter. Remember, I told you how to make that connection with why it's important that you, as maybe a, an A1C maintainer in the age shop, uh, needs to be able to tell people about Jesus, but also so does a, a tech sergeant in medical group and. Uh, how that connects with first to the Jew, then the Greek. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then finally, the workplace, our mission field. We're going to focus in specifically on DOD and Air Force policies and dispel some myths. Okay? And the good news is, yes, you can share your faith. Okay? For a certain way, you got to do it. you got to do it wisely. you got to do it as led by the Spirit. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's where we're going to be going with the next five. And they're not going to be as breathless as this one. Okay? A lot of information out there, so thank you for your patience. So, with that, I do have a homework assignment. Now, I tell everyone the homework is optional, but it will help. I'm not going to, I may ask, I will ask for some people maybe if they want to share a little bit about their homework, uh, to, that they may. So, you guys are, I can hand you guys things. I'm doing this slowly. But this will help you to grow. And this is just a, a self-study for you to dig a little further into the Scriptures and to evaluate what you believe about evangelism. Because uh, if you recall when I started out, uh, I reminded you that one thing that birthed this process was the discovery from the Scriptures and from talking to people that maybe the reason they were getting in trouble doing evangelism is they really didn't understand what evangelism was. And so they were trying to be obedient as best as they could, but not really knowing what it was, they were stepping into some landmines. So it's important to know what it is. So this is uh, designed to help you to do a little self-study into what evangelism is. So with that, do you guys have any questions? I thank each and every one of you for being involved. I'm going to close this in prayer in a little bit. And if you did not do a pretest and sign in, I need you to do a pretest and sign in. Shouldn't take long. Final thoughts? All right, I'm going to pray for us. Lord, thank you for these men and women. God, I just thank you so much. And just give you the glory of their presence here tonight and their attendance. Now, Lord, I pray that you will help us to live lives that speak of you. And then, as opportunities arise, to speak of you. Uh, Lord, I pray for these men and women as they're committed to your ways and to your word. And that you'll give them opportunities to glorify your name, to make your name known throughout the earth as you've always wanted it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll hang around if you have any questions.